episode 291 of the Tennis Files podcast, you'll learn how to become a resilient competitor with Dr. Larry Lauer. Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is Mirban. I am back from a fun trip to the UK. Uh, so I'm finally going to be able to play some tennis again, which I'm really excited about. And while looking through my catalog of episodes, I found an interview with Dr. Larry Lauer on uh, the mental game side of things, which is obviously um, vastly underestimated by a lot of players, rarely practiced. Um, usually we just practice our strokes and sometimes our strategies, but rarely the mental side. So um, in this conversation, Dr. Lauer and I talked about how to become a more resilient competitor, a step-by-step -step process for improving your on-court performance, how to deal with pre-match nerves, mental training that you can do while you're at home, uh, and a lot more. So I really do hope that you enjoy this interview that Larry and I previously did. Um, so without further ado, here is my conversation with Dr. Larry. Lauer. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Tennis Files podcast. I'm really pleased to have Dr. Larry Lauer from USTA Player Development and also the host of Compete Like a Champion podcast on the show to talk about the mental side of the game. I think uh, the mental game is severely underlooked and uh, we really need it, especially in, in this particular time that we're facing. You know, just in general, we need mental fortitude and resiliency. And that's why I think that uh, having uh, Dr. Lauer on the show is just a fantastic, uh, you know, blessing to, to have. So, uh, Larry, uh, I just want to welcome you onto the show and uh, really appreciate you coming on today. No, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, anytime. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to asking you a lot of uh, questions about the mental game. But uh, I just want to ask you, uh, you know, just a couple, I guess, maybe fun questions. But are there any uh, new hobbies or anything that you've picked up, you know, while uh, staying isolated? Or have you been just still super busy with uh, with your work? Still super busy. Uh, I think the mental, now people have time to look into some of these things and to work on the mental side. So I've, I've become busier in some ways. Uh, you know, we always find a way to use our time. But uh, busier with, with working with athletes uh, even more so now because they have the time to work on these things, but also still finding ways to improve myself, you know, spending a lot of time with uh, my son working on inline hockey. He's an ice hockey player. So we uh, get out and skate every day and work on things and uh, something with his baseball as well. And so, yeah, so just getting out and, and, and playing hockey and doing different things. Uh, you know, I don't get to play tennis right now, but uh, usually I would uh, when I get a chance, but uh that's how I'm staying busy and, and and working on a book project. So there's more than enough going on. Wonderful. I love hearing that. Uh, you know, you you know, you work with player development, and I think what you just said is really important about just taking this time that we have, uh, you know, all inside to to work on our on developing ourselves and uh, you know our all facets. You know, you can still work on your your physicality, your your fitness, and and the mental game as well. And you can still even work on your strokes. You know, shadow swings and so forth. So I'm glad to hear that uh, from your end, Larry. And uh, I also want to you know ask you about uh, well to start off with resiliency because I I've, I listened to a bunch of your uh, talks on YouTube and really enjoyed them and. Uh, this is one aspect that you touched upon, uh, obviously. So first off, what does it mean to be a resilient competitor? Yeah, so the resilient competitor, the way I look at that is that a resilient competitor is someone who bounces back, is always there competing, always fighting, uh, is prepared for every point. They're the, the competitor who they're going to lose points, but they're not going to string bad points together. Um, they'll, they'll likely string good points together, but they're not necessarily going to lose a lot of points in a row or play at least poor points in a row because they find a way to, to bounce back and to be ready to play again. So for me, the resilient competitor is someone who adapts well, is able to stay present, embraces adversity, and embraces surprises and mistakes as opportunities to get better, and certainly finds way to surround themselves with 
others who are supportive and they support them. So they kind of put this insular bubble around themselves. You know, if you think about even like in team sport when they're in the playoffs and they talk about resilience, you know, you know, communicating a lot with their teammates and uh, just seeing the positives to things, the resilient competitor is really doing that, that when things aren't looking good, when there's adversity, they can see the positive. When they're not feeling well, they can channel that in a good way. They accept how they feel. They accept the situation that they're in, and they find a way to problem solve and make the most of it. And certainly, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's a great time to build on our resilience because we're all dealing with it. Um, but definitely the resilient competitor to me is is primary because tennis is a sport where there's a lot of mistakes and there are a lot of unforced errors and forced errors. Very, very, very rarely in the history of tennis has there been a golden set. So you know that you're going to have some mistakes. You know there's going to be some adversity in every match you play. So it's more about being resilient and finding a way than it is about being perfect. I agree with stuff, Larry. And, um, yeah, I mean, when, when we talk about uh, resiliency, um, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, what's an example of a player that, that you, uh, that you maybe w- when you're training, uh, your, your players at, at the, uh, in Orlando that you say, Hey, you know, this is a really good model of, of what resiliency is all about. Yeah. So we'll use, we'll use, you know, Serena Williams or Rafa Nadal or Djokovic, Federer, uh, Sharapova. Um, we definitely like to get the, the juniors to look up to other American players. Obviously, you know, Sonia Kennan has displayed a lot of mental toughness um, throughout her career, but definitely recently, too, in big matches. Uh, so I think we, we just try to attune them to, to different times that players have these great mental performances and, and, and the ways that they're doing that, how they, they go about that with their routines, the way they're handling stress, how they're handling anxiety, uh, adversity. Uh, mistakes. So uh, we're we're constantly trying to provide, you know, these peer models or models, uh, even if they're, you know, 30 and, and they're 17, but uh, they give them something to sort of look up to and see what can be done. Um, but I think that's really important in the process because we need young players to realize that resilience is something that everyone can do. And, you know, I've heard, you know, people talk about it as sort of ordinary magic, that it's magical when it happens, but we all have that within us. And and so how do we find that within ourselves? Well, first, having awareness that it's possible and remembering the times that we have done it and looking to other models of how they're doing it. And I think it's important to use the best, but I also think it's important to use the people around them who they're playing against or family members or coaches um, so they can connect even better with it. Because I think sometimes we use Serena as an example all the time. The players feel like, well, that's Serena. Like, she's the best of all time. How am I supposed to relate to that? But if you can show them the practical, specific things that she's doing, that those things are repeatable. I'm not saying you're going to have Serena's serve or her strength. But you, there are certain things you you can develop. And, and here's how you would do it. So So it's very important to get the buy-in and to give them sort of a a model and a destination for where they want to end up. Right, Larry. So, uh, yeah, you touched upon the next question I want to ask you, uh, which is where resilience comes from. So, um, I mean, it clearly from what you're saying, it's not just like innate, you're not just born with it, but it's something that you can actually, even if you previously were not, uh, did, do not perform, uh, well under pressure. Like it's something that you can still train and you're able to gradually become resilient through different sources. Is that the correct assessment? That is correct. Uh, our research is showing us that you can develop your resilience, but I think you have to think of resilience as there is an innate part of it or a personality trait. And some people have bigger buckets than others naturally for for the, the level of resilience, the degree of resilience they typically have. But then you can develop that and make that bucket deeper, that that capacity to be resilient. And that's what a lot of the research is focused on, is how, how does that happen? How do we do that? And I think, you know, Sarkar and others have found that if you're you're able to focus on three things, one is that 
you have to have adversity and to be resilient, right? You can't exist without some adversity, stress, anxiety, because that creates growth. It creates a challenge. You overcome the challenge. You get stronger emotionally, mentally, physically. You have to have really good coping skills. So if you want to be resilient, it's, it's sort of an outcome of other processes of being able to focus in the moment, of being able to have a focus on process goals of how you want to perform versus winning and losing, right? Uh, it's the ability to be confident and trust in your skills, to be able to visualize success and how you would do certain things in the future as you rehearse. It's using your coping and mental skills to be able to be resilient. It's how you think about situations. Uh, you know, I take on a loss. Okay, that's one loss. I'll be ready for the next match versus, oh, I lost again in the first round. I have no idea how to win matches anymore. I'm, I'm lost, right? And that, that perception, the difference between those two is, is light years in terms of the way you're going to be able to move forward in your work and being prepared for the next match. So you, you talk about these three pillars. You have to have adversity. You need to master your coping skills. And then you got to have support. And you can't go it alone. You have to have others who are supportive, that help you, who will give you advice, who will pick you up, encourage you, who also challenge you. They push you to be better. They push you to see reality, to find ways to, to find the places to grow and to challenge yourself. So I think a, a simple way to think about it, you know, within the athlete or the player is that there's really three um, pillars to this. And then it's the environment that you put them in. This challenge and support uh, where, you know, we're supporting them, we're encouraging them, we're teaching them the skills necessary, we're communicating with them, we're letting them know that we got their back, that they can do it. And at the same time, we're pushing them, we're challenging, like, hey, you know, I know you can do more than I, I know that that's not the response you wanted. How can you respond better? And I think that supportive challenge environment is what you're going to need to develop that resilient competitor. Gotcha, Larry. So uh, what if we're like a competitive amateur tennis player and we, uh, you know, we don't necessarily train um, in like a, a fantastic, uh, you know, environment like at, at USTA uh, National Campus. Uh, and maybe we're even in like a town that doesn't have that many facilities so like what, what would you uh suggest to them to do in terms of like still creating that environment of uh and finding somebody like supportive to uh to be able to still help them on their journey to becoming more resilient that's a great question to try to frame it because your your environment is your reality right and so if you're able to find others who have the passion for tennis or whatever sport you're doing that you have and want to train and get better, uh, then you have a start, right? So you have other people who can push you, who can challenge you. Uh, I think you can find mentors anywhere. Uh, tennis pros uh, could be people in strength and conditioning, prof professional strength and conditioning, possibly mental coaches or sports psychologists. But I think if you, you look out, there's people in the community who also can help you in every community. Uh, I think that a, a lot of the athletes are turning to, you know, not just uh, to working specifically with me, but they'll work with other folks as well, therapists, psychologists, and clinicians to support their overall growth. And so I think there's always an opportunity in building up the people around you you know, example I like to use is after I had my shoulder surgery, um, the the PT that I that I became to know and became a good friend, um, he challenged me and supported me in so many ways during that that rehab that I was coming back back from, and you know, he became a part of my my circle, my team, where you know now I could rely on him not only for support but for challenge, right? And and so I think we all have that opportunity, but I think it starts with finding if it, we're talking specifically about tennis finding other people who have similar goals and really getting out there and training together practicing together challenging one another having fun with it um, i think is extremely important and then there's the work you do on your own and there's so much that can be done on your own 
from reading books to watching videos to just introspection and learning about yourself. Um, one of my favorite activities to do is just to, to take stock of where I'm at. You know, what stressors, adversities, what mistakes have I made? And then how am I responding to those things? Am I trying to hold on to perfect and, and maybe not take responsibility for the things that are happening? Or am I meeting those things head on? And am I being honest about them? And am I problem solving? Am I responding in a good way? And I think that's very important. So even that as an exercise is something that anyone can do on a regular basis is to check in and just be aware of the stressors, adversities, the mistakes, the things that they're dealing with. And then what are your responses? Because the reality is you don't control a lot of the stuff that happens to you. You control how you respond to it. Right. hundred percent. And so uh, you actually, I think you just answered my next question, but I might have to modify it. So my question was going to be, uh, you know, especially in the face of what's happening today, what is one daily activity that we can uh, undertake uh, each day, obviously, to that will really help us uh, help us improve our mental game. And if the answer is what you just mentioned, then maybe it could be one other activity besides that. Sure. I guess I'll give you um, more of a, a system or a schedule first, and then a specific example. So, obviously, there's a lot of stress during this time, anxiety about the future of the world, of what's going to happen to people, what's going to happen to our family, what's going to happen to our jobs and the economy. There's a lot of things out there to really take you down the, the path of fear and anxiety and, and to lack the calm and the ease and the peace that you want in your life. And so what we have to do is manage our focus, right? And we manage our focus by, well, getting very practical, being on a schedule. When you wake up in the morning, take time to be mindful, be aware of where your head is, um, what you're thinking and begin to let those thoughts and feelings pass through and focus more on your goals for the day and what you want to achieve and how you're going to get better, how you're going to help somebody else during that, that day. And then a huge uh, way of being able to counteract the anxiety and the fear is focusing on what you're grateful for and the silver lining in this situation. You know, it's tough with, with the, the tragedy of, the number of lives being lost to this virus. And at the same time, we must move forward and we must continue to, to stay positive as much as we can. And so we have to look for the opportunities, as my good friend Jose Higuera says, in, in the rough situations and find that silver lining. And so, you know, how can you use this time to con be closer with your family, to connect? Uh, but getting on a schedule is important doing something in the morning to set the stage. You know, Kobe Bryant talked about doing meditation in the morning just to kind of clear his head and, and get to that place where he was present and at peace to start his day. I think it's so important to prime yourself to start up the day that way. And then as you go through your day, as you're executing on your goals and the different things you're going to do, your tasks, you become present. You When you catch yourself as uh, Johnny Parks, who's on the podcast with myself, Peter Like Champion podcast, we talk about going down a rabbit hole. You got to catch yourself and bring yourself back to the present by taking a couple breaths, by remembering what your purpose is in the moment and giving yourself license to let go, to let those things pass through. They do not need to control your mind or your behavior. And then I think at the end of the day, you need to take stock on where I'm at, reflection. Reflection is a great way to cement in the lessons learned from today, to have those feelings of gratitude, to feel at ease again at the end of the day so you can be peaceful as you, you're you winding down and you're thinking about going to sleep. So you get on this kind of schedule and you bookend your day's work with feelings of gratitude and being at ease. Now, what are some of those exercises? Well, a good one is, I've mentioned mindfulness, is just to do some mindful breathing to sit quietly, focus on your breath. When you notice your mind being captivated by a thought or a feeling and starting to, to go down that rabbit hole, recognize it, acknowledge it, let it pass through, bring your focus back to your breath and just be present. 
uh, this is going to calm you down. This is going to make you feel at ease, relaxed, more clear, aware, de-stress, take out the anxiety. It's a great practice that I encourage everyone to do every day um, to start your day. And then I, I like to have, I do this myself, is to visualize my goals for the day and how I'm going to achieve them and what it's going to feel like when you do achieve them. That's going to really get you purpose, purposeful and intentional to start your day. And then, again, like I mentioned before, what you're grateful for, because that brings perspective. That, that brings a feeling of, of the good, the silver lining, the opportunity in the day. Yeah, just so many wonderful uh, practices that you mentioned there. Uh, you know, in particular, you mentioned visualization. I was talking with Rick Macy the other day, uh, and he mentioned that that was, you know, his one of his most powerful tools uh, to use with with himself and his players. And also meditation. Uh, I, I use the Calm app uh, every single morning to do that. Uh, Headspace is also really good. Um, and then you talk about reflection, and uh, I, I watched in uh, in a presentation the USA Hockey um, that you gave. Uh, you mentioned that as little as five to ten minutes of reflection per day creates stronger connections in the brain that actually helps you deal with future situations, which I found really fascinating. So I was wondering if you could kind of talk a bit more about that. Certainly, uh, I think that what we're seeing is that. When we research this area that people who reflect, and it doesn't have to be extensive reflection, are more likely to remember those lessons, those memories the next day, because you just think about you're strengthening those neural connections, right? You're you're really burning them into the hard drive. You strengthen those connections, they're easier to access the next day. Because think about what the brain's doing while you sleep. It's cleaning up the things that aren't important to you, right? The things you're not accessing, this idea of pruning. It's going around and pruning these neural connections. Ah, you know, you're not using that, so we can kind of clean that up. And and the ones you are using, you're grooving a lot, like your tennis forehand and backhand. It's going to make sure that those stay, you know, those connections stay strong, right? But it's kind of the idea of use it or lose it. So you reflect on those lessons that you learn. You're more likely to remember that the next day. But also what we found is that one of the really cool things is that you're more likely to be able to take that lesson or that memory and adapt it to a new situation. Because the thing about what your brain is doing is like, okay, I, I learned something with my movement to the ball yesterday. Okay. Maybe on my forehand, maybe there's something there I can apply to the movement on the backhand as well tomorrow. So again, I think what we're seeing with the reflection, this is a way to cement in the lessons to secure learning and improve retention of, of your experiences each day, which is absolutely crucial because the thing that we all got to do is to learn. And if you want to be a high performance tennis player or you just want to improve on your goals, you need to find ways to improve and improve faster. And reflection is one of those. Awesome. And uh, Larry, you you worked uh, for a number of years with uh, you, with USA Hockey. I think their national team development program. That's correct. And, yes. Yeah, and so I'm wondering, is there any sort of like uh, trait on the mental side that you found was prevalent in hockey that you think uh, should be more prevalent uh, with tennis players or vice versa? Uh, that's a great question. You know, I've thought about this and I've been asked this before, and. I don't have like the the iron lock statement on this, like this is for sure, but just kind of reflecting on that. I think one is that the hockey culture is a very tough culture and it's one where you have to go out and display your physicality, even if there's no fighting, let's just take fighting out of it, but your physicality, your toughness, if there's checking, um, it's a very tough culture. It's very physical. And I think players, uh, really focus on that side of the game and they use that side to be prepared to play. They make it very physical. They make it about speed and, and aggression and assertiveness. I think tennis players could borrow from that more. I think they focus a lot on, certainly on strategy, which I think is very important, uh, but also on the technical too much and on how things feel with the forehand, with the backhand. I think a lot of the teaching that they get at a young age is very technical. So they, they tend to have that lens with which they see their games as technique based. So if something happens, their first thing is to try to fix their technique. Well, we know that 
from the theory and the research that focusing on technique for, for performance situations is not a good thing. Uh, bringing technique to mind usually makes a performance worse. So I think what tennis players can borrow from hockey is this idea of focusing on the physical and the, and the toughness and the, and the speed and explosiveness. And we try to really highlight those things with the players. And I do think at the top of the game um, that those guys probably uh, illustrate that a lot, right? Um, the, the, so just the agility and the, and the just the ability to get every ball back that Djokovic has, you know, just that determination, that grit of Nadal, the unbelievable footwork of Federer and how he, he's able to get to everything. Um, I think these, these physical things are things you want to more focus on uh, than on the technique. Now, turning it back the other way, all right, I always thought that hockey, um, the players themselves, okay, if they, if they were to take from tennis, I think it's that individual responsibility for the performance. Because what can happen within a team is this sort of uh, where, the, where the individual responsibility sort of gets dispersed across people and it's easier for people to hide. In tennis, there's no hiding. There's no place to hide. You're out there by themselves. If you want any, any sort of really deep thought on this, read any interviews that Agassi has done about this or his book on open or, or the open book. And he talks about that, that solitude, that loneliness a lot. Uh, but that also that that's what a lot of what draws athletes to tennis is that they are individually responsible for what happens and they have more control over the result and the process of what's going on than does a hockey player. So, I mean, you can look at two sides of the coin, a hockey player, the team aspect and the joy of sacrificing together and working together to achieve this greater goal is awesome. And for a tennis player, being solely responsible for what's about to happen, um, you, you feel more of a sense of control. Some of that control is, uh, is illusionary because there's a lot of control we try to take that we don't actually have control on certain things. But nonetheless, I do think there's, there's great things about all the different sports, you know, tennis, the fact that you have to coach yourself, uh, you don't get, and that's changing a little bit, but you don't get much coaching uh, in these matches. And the independence that has to be shown is amazing. So I think there are things that, that go both ways. So do you think that players in individual sports should, should expose themselves a bit to team sports as well? And then those in team sports should also play some individual sports? Do you think that like the exposure to the other side will, will help them overall? Yeah, I believe so, 100%. Especially with younger players, and you know, won't get, unless you ask me, wouldn't necessarily get into specialization. But just this idea of you want to get these multiple experiences because they give you different learning opportunities. When I play it on a team, I have to give of myself to others. I have to sacrifice for my brothers and my sisters to reach a common goal. And that's an amazing thing. That's going to help you so much in your life. And on the other side of that, you know, being solely responsible and having, having to take that responsibility for what's going to happen is also amazing. And so I think that there's so many different things, you know, when you, when you work in team sport, uh, having multiple uh, coaches, different personalities, uh, feeling like, you know, you can't let others down. And although tennis players do experience that as well, I think it's, it's slightly different in a team sport environment. And again, it's certainly in tennis that I'm out here alone. I have to figure this out. I have to find a way. Um, so I do think putting children in these different team and individual sports, they can develop different experiences, which is getting at some of the same stuff at the end of the day, right? Confidence and resilience and the competitiveness competitiveness that we want to see in, in young athletes yeah, excellent stuff yeah i think like oh go ahead as sorry well, coachability as well no. sorry i just want to say coachability as well yeah for sure and yeah uh, as you mentioned yeah i think that uh that it, it would be really helpful for tennis players to 
participate in more team uh, oriented uh, sports or activities cuz you know you're still you're still working with with a team you know if you have a coach and a physio and and, and think other coaches so it kind of helps you deal with them better cuz i have a, a lot of respect for um you know those champions who are always shouting out their team and uh you know it's it's still working with a bunch of people to achieve your desired result um so uh in part of watching that uh one of the presentations you gave you mentioned that you were brought in and i, I think about seven years ago uh to usta pd because they wanted to you to help them compete better and they didn't feel like they were competing well enough so i was wondering if you could kind of talk about that and and specifically you know what types of changes you had to make in order to help the help foster you know a better uh you know environment of of competing well yeah that's a that's a really good question and you've done your research so that's great so uh, appreciate that well i think when i started the reason for that position it was the first time there was a full-time mental coach position within player development was that our, our coaches needed the support of someone on the ground, of giving them ideas, helping them, helping them deal with specific situations, helping the players directly. So the, the coaches really wanted and needed that support. And I was fortunate enough to, to um, be given that position. And, and so, you know, I, I don't want to at all put down what the previous generations had done because there's a great mental performers amongst all the generations. But I think there was an overall feeling in general that um, we wanted to see American competitors uh, be even more engaged in, in their training and more focused in matches and less distracted and, and certainly to be more resilient and deal with the pressure moments even better and, and their anxiety about those situations. So, you know, when I started, I took about the first year just to observe and to ask questions and just shadow coaches and, and talk to players and get to know people and understand the, the culture. And I had been around tennis. It wasn't like I was a newbie to tennis, but I was not a uh, tennis lifer like everybody else I was dealing with, obviously, is a lot of the hockey stuff that you've mentioned. So I needed to kind of have a really good feel for what was happening and, and why it was happening. And through that first year, I learned a lot um, of what was going on. And I really felt like we needed to have more of a process focus. Um, I saw the great work that coaches were doing and the performance staff. And they really, uh, they were expressing, communicating great support for the players, as well, as well as unbelievable ideas and skills and strategies. And so the why, why was this not going maybe the way they had, had hoped at that time? Because I also knew we had very, very good players. That I didn't think was the issue. And so it became more about recentering the focus on the process, the way you train every day, the way you go about your business. And these are things the coaches were already talking about. But I think hearing it from a third party and then taking it to another level of our mission, this is where the compete like a champion motto came from. And then the mission of the seven values to make it more of a character mission that we believe that character enhances performance, but also everyone can become better when we're focused on character, whether you make your, your big tennis goals or not, you become a better person for it and not a worse or unhealthy person because of it. And so that really became the mission working with the coaching staff was to communicate, brand this idea of com compete like a champion, get that idea in everybody's minds. And then from there, define what these values are, like resilience, like confidence, toughness, determination, respect, engagement. Define these things and talk about, well, how do we demonstrate those things on a daily basis? How do we demonstrate them in practice? How do we demonstrate them in matches? And turn the conversation from, in the player's minds, I need to win to show that I deserve support to I need to engage every single day and go about things in a way that I'm proud in terms of how I'm dealing with stuff. And, and feeling that I can walk around proud and I know that I'm earning um, what I'm receiving. And so 
just that, just changing the focus from, you know, a lot of outcome. And again, I don't even think our coaches were expressing outcome that much, but it was just the, the nature of the environment, right? You're getting support by a national governing body. You want to perform well on the big stage. You start to put a lot of pressure, put the 800 pound grill on your shoulders. And you needed a refocus on, on the process about, you know, this is, yes, winning and losing at the end of the day are still um, what everybody's going to talk about in their rankings. But it's the way you go about this every single day. And if you go about it in a great way, you might not win today, but it's my faith that you will win more for that. You'll get closer to your goals. You might even achieve your big dream goals or more um, by focusing on the process every day of how to become better, become the person you want to be. And yeah, great stuff again, Larry. Yeah, I, mean, I think you answered my next question because I was going to ask you, you know, I remember seeing that uh, banner uh, uh, draped on the fence of one of the courts that had the seven uh, core principles. And, you know, what came into my head is I was wondering how you make these principles actually meaningful because there's, of course, you know, some organizations where they'll just write, you know, these random principles and then they won't even they won't put the groundwork in to actually uh, inculcate like these principles into the environment, you know, they'll just have it there and that's it. So it seems like it really takes a lot of daily work and uh, effort to to ingrain uh, the principles in your players. Um, that's a that's a great point, and I think it's a it's a matter of certainly branding it and having it out in front of the players so they see it in different ways. And then I think it's it's the communication from the staff from the coaches and bringing the conversation back to those values often and they often become part of the solution right and so instead of talking about a bunch of different things and a bunch of different words using a similar language across the staff and saying look we want to develop resilience you know the ability to bounce back to adapt to find a way and once everybody starts talking the same way it changes how the players start to talk in their own minds and they start to use the words and so one of our, our first moves after we, as a staff, developed the Compete Like a Champion mission and the banner with the seven values was to define it and then put it into all of our junior camps. And every one of the camps, we just went through and talked about what it, the seven values meant and had a conversation with the players. And then we would define behaviors that would either represent that or maybe the opposite, not be that. And that sort of onboarding process was very important because it changed the language and the way that people were thinking about things. And I always am reminded, um, you know, by some of our coaches, especially coach Richard Ashby on our staff, like, Hey, we got to keep coming back to home base that the seven values, being like a champion, being resilient, confident competitors, that's our home base. We got to make sure that everybody's aware of that. Um, and so a set of something that, that hangs on a, on a fence. Um, you got to bring it to life as you're saying. And so it has to be part of the conversation every day. You've got to bring it into your trainings. And um, we do it with all our junior camps and we talk about the different values and then we go deep into them. So it needs to be a part of everything you do and, and a constant communication. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. I was wondering if you could give us some insights into the training that your top level players uh, at, at USDA do. Uh, so for, for those players who are actually there for a, a significant period of time, or maybe the off season, I was wondering the, how frequently they train on the mental game and maybe what a typical mental game training session might be like for these players. Okay. So I think it, it's important to start with how I was trained and I was trained as an educational sports psych professional in my philosophy, my belief is that you prepare the athletes to be their own mental coach. And I'm constantly trying to prepare it to a level where eventually I'll be out of a job where they won't necessarily need me as much. This idea of independence, right? And so that's, that's where I come from. I'm not looking to develop dependence. I'm actually looking to develop independence from me because that's the only way that they can perform in a sport because I will never be on the court with them in a tournament when it matters. I will always be on the sideline or not even there 
because they're in Asia and I'm in Orlando. So you got to be able to do this for yourself. And so the training, obviously, you know, you go through progressions, but when you start, depending on what it is too, but you start and you do more work, you might meet a couple times a week, talk regularly, uh, just to make sure you're getting them immersed in it, moving forward, but you're still giving them things to do on their own. Uh, whether it's take one of the exercises before the mindful breathing. Now they have to go and practice that daily in the morning. And then when we talk or we meet, they bring in their feedback on how that's going. And a big part of this conversation is too, as well, because, you know, I'm not trying to develop monks. What I'm trying to develop are great tennis players who understand how to be present. We quickly have to get in the conversation of, why? Why does this? Why is this important for your game? Why is this going to help you? How are you going to apply this? And those conversations about application, and then getting to the court and actually applying it, or in the gym and applying it, or in your life and applying it, are very important. So, you got to skill build early on, and that takes some work, but you got to get them also looking at how to apply it in different ways in their their tennis and their life. And then as you move along. A lot of my athletes, you know, we talk once a week and they're training themselves throughout the week and they'll give me feedback on how the week went, questions that they have. When they're on the road, we might talk a little bit less. We might talk a little bit more. It depends on who it is and what we're working on. Again, eventually you're getting to a point where, you know, you're still checking in, but they have a lot of the answers to the questions. And then they know that, okay, well, I'm not sure what to do with this, so I'm going to call Larry and we're going to have a discussion about it. Um, so I want to hand over that, that power of that knowledge. So, but yeah, typically when you start your meeting a couple of times a week or once a week, pretty regularly, but I want everybody to understand that the mental training is always going on. Your brain is always engaged when you're playing tennis or you're lifting weights, you're running on the track. Um, when you make the choice on what you're going to eat, when you're going to go to sleep, um, the things you do in your off times, how you connect with your family, your, the way your brain and the way you're seeing the world and decisions you're making is all a part of your mental training. And then you just try to highlight certain things. Like I talked about the, the mindfulness practice in the morning, going into the mental gym and then doing your push-ups mentally um, is important. But understanding your brain is engaged all the time and how are you responding to what is coming from your brain and how are you using that information so you have with mental training you know i guess there's you you train it in formal ways when you meet with a mental coach like myself and then when you spend specific times like visualizing your best performances and you set a time in your schedule and you work on that you need to do those things and then there's just sort of the daily work that's always ongoing and how are you seeing the world and how are you responding to things and and that's important, as, as I mentioned as well. And so that's why it's important to get players on a schedule so that they're always developing themselves. All right, great stuff there. A couple, uh, I guess, specific situations. Well, I guess kind of specific. But before matches, uh, of course, players, um, we often have pre-match nerves. So I was wondering what types of steps uh, you generally would suggest that we take before matches to help us uh, ensure that we can perform our best during the match? That's, a, that's an important question, something that all players are interested in, or most players uh, experience those nerves. And I think that's your first point, is that the nerves are pretty normal. And in fact, understanding that these nerves come from a place because you care. So they come from a good place. Now, they could come also from not feeling prepared. Maybe there's a part of your game you're not confident in right now. Maybe it's the matchup. And that's reality. That's information. But understand these nerves are normal, and that's your body getting ready to perform. And you need to change the way you look at stress. That stress is going to create growth. Um, a lot of times players look at, oh, this is a bad matchup for me. This is bad. This is bad. This is a great opportunity. Can you find a way today? Can you figure out a solution to something that's perplexed you in the past? Because if you do, you're going to feel amazing afterwards. So there's always opportunity in these stressful situations. So you want to channel your focus in a different way. Look at how it's normal. It's your body getting ready. Those butterflies 
or something you embrace that you look forward to because now you know, oh, you got my attention. I'm going to be ready to bring it. And then, you know, being aware of, okay, where are the doubts coming from? If I've done my preparation, then I don't have to doubt anything. I just let it fly. Just go for it. If there's some real reasons for me to doubt, maybe I didn't have a couple good weeks of practice, maybe not feeling that fit or I got an injury. Um, okay. Well, you're going to have to accept that and you're going to have to refocus on what you can control. So in these conversations, you get into that pretty quickly and then engaging in things like uh, routines of doing like the breathing that I mentioned, visualizing um, how you're going to play versus the, you know, the importance of the outcome. So getting yourself more process focused are very important leading new match, having a very vigorous warm up. And again, this is all based on your fitness level, your tennis playing level. Uh, but one of the things is just to go out and burn some of that nervous energy off in the warm up. You know, go and hit and in the warm up, play some points. I know that's probably completely countercultural, but you want to engage and feel like the match has already started when you're in the warm up. You want the heart beating, you want the, the breath to be fast, you want to, to be sweating, you want your mind thinking about how you're playing points, and you want to feel like you've hit all your shots and your patterns. So when you get into a match, it's like, hey, man, been there, done that. I'm just continuing what happened in the warm up, I'm ready to go. Um, you know, so I think that's an important way to think about it. Love it. I appreciate that. Uh, and I love the, the reframing aspect that you mentioned and how we can flip our situation. You know, I, I like, uh, this principle from, uh, David Goggins. He's not a tennis player, but you know, he talks about, you know, framing it to saying, well, you know, I'm not expected to be able to accomplish this, to beat this number one seed but what if i'm i'm actually able to do it how amazing would that be and then kind of just spin it to a positive light from there um and, and so now shifting to during a match just want to ask you about uh you know you talk about the importance of routines i was wondering like what types of routines have you found to be quite effective uh that we maybe would want to integrate into our matches to help us be successful yes well i have found you have to know what the goal is for the routine. And the goal is to be ready to play, right? Is to be present, to have a plan, to be, to be possibly energized, to be ready to play. And so if you know what the goal is, then the routine sets that up. And I always talk about, you know, between point routines with our players. I think all players should have a between point routine. Now, a recreational player is not going to do a routine at a level of Sharapova or Bartoli or Djokovic or Nadal, it just probably is not going to happen. And I don't know that it's necessary, but I think you, as a recreational player, you need to do two things. Number one, you need to recover. You need to make sure you slow down your breathing, you gather yourself, you compose yourself before you start the next point. Number two, have a plan. Maybe it's just where you want to hit your serve, um, you know, something that's working for you, or something that's not, uh, but going to things that are working, that's enough right there to have success if you just do those two things. Now, people talk a lot about these idiosyncrasies and behaviors they see from players between points. A lot of them are just little things that they do to keep their mind off of the pressures of the moment, the score, can I succeed, will I not? Um, so the, the tugging at the shorts and the hat and the little – Ritualistic things are just ways for them to quiet their mind that they've developed over time. You just want to know as a player, what are the key things I need to do? For performance players, number one, after the point ends, make sure you respond neutral or positive. So you're not telling your opponent how bad you're feeling right now if you've missed. Also, that you get that between points time period started off on a good foot by going to your strings by walking away. So it's not as hard to get to the point where you're ready to play the next point. Second step is to, is to really recover, as I mentioned before, taking deep breaths, taking some time, tallying off to make sure you cool off a little bit, especially if you're emotional. Number three, refocus, get your mind focused on your plan for the next point, what you will do, like I mentioned before. It's very useful to do it in authoritative terms, like, hey, I will, hit this serve in the corner and go open court. And number four is to be ready. Now you're going through your little rituals. You know, if you're returning serve, 
getting deep into that return stance, taking your breath, quieting your mind, just focusing on the ball. If you're serving, being clear about where you're going to hit it, maybe you give yourself one little reminder like, hey, man, just trust and go for it. Let it rip. Um, being rhythmic in your, your service routine, bouncing the ball maybe the same number of times. But all you're doing in this last stage is quieting the mind, right? And just getting into a rhythm of being physical versus being in the cognitive or the mental. That's the four-step routine. I teach all the players those four R's. Um, I think it's a, it's a simple yet comprehensive way to work at these things. Um, and I think every player, whether you're, you know, just play for fun, at least, you know, recovering and doing some deep breaths to make sure you feel ready, maybe pay, having a plan to a performance player that should have all four steps at some point, keeping in mind that little kids aren't very good at elaborate plans. They, so you got to start slow. And then also keeping in mind that the steps that are in a routine is like, I'll hear people say like, well, just go to the towel. The towel does nothing other than white sweat, sweat away unless it has meaning, unless it's symbolic. When I go to the towel, does that mean I'm wiping away the last point and it's going down on the fence or down on the court with it and I've moved on? Is it a moving away from the last point? Right? So every step that we take in our, our routine should have some meaning. It should be leading me towards that feeling of being ready, quieting my mind, and just playing the point. Awesome stuff. Thank you so much for those. Uh, those concrete steps are going to be super helpful for a lot of us. And I encourage you to rewind a bit and listen to that again. Um, at, so before I ask you about um, the Compete Like a Champion podcast, uh, one other real quick question for you is, what are some of your favorite books that you would gift tennis players to help them improve their mental game? Well, you, you mentioned the Goggins book. I, I think that's helping a lot of players. Um, we're sharing that with players right now. I was always been a big fan of In, In Pursuit of Excellence by Terry Orlick. That may not be known by certain people. He's a sports psychologist from Canada. I always thought that was a comprehensive look at how to train the mind and prepare for competition. Uh, so I think that's a good one. For kids, a book called Mind Gym, G-Y-M, uh, by Gary Mack is an excellent book. It's in short bits, easy, easy uh, consumed, and, and kids, lots of stories that they can can read and understand. I think that's an, an excellent book. As you get with maybe a little bit more mature, advanced players, you can get in things like In Pursuit of Excellence. Um, you know, I, I'm reading a book right now by Holiday. It's uh, Obstacles Are the Way. I think that's a great book. The Obstacle Is the Way, excuse me. I want to make sure I got that right. I'm just looking on my desk. Uh, so I think that's an excellent book. But there's there's been many over the years you know, that we've shared. I think for coaches and for older players, uh, my teens mindset by Carol Dweck is a great book and learning just about how to, you know, challenge yourself and, and embrace challenge and difficult things and learn through it, I think is a, a unbelievable um, book that she wrote. So, um, you know, so many, so many great books out there. I'm sure I'm missing a lot, but those are a couple that come to mind. Awesome. Appreciate that. And uh, I just want to ask you about uh, the Compete Like a Champion podcast, really a, an excellent podcast. And I see you've had some great guests on, too. I, I've got to listen to the last one with Noah Rubin. But I just want to ask you what the Compete Like a Champion podcast is all about and then where people can check it out. So Compete Like a Champion is all about the cutting edge of sports science. And we typically bring it back to psychology because that's my training and, and my, my biggest interest. But What's happening in pro sport, what's happening in high performance uh, and how that might relate to juniors and even recreational players, what can be learned, um, what's the newest, the latest, um, what are people doing that are in these spaces, in the pro space, in the collegiate space. So I think these things uh, people are interested in. We're very interested in our guests. Sometimes we'll have guests on. Other times it's just Johnny Parks and I going back and forth on a subject and talking about it. So uh, the Compete Like a Champion podcast, um, we're looking to always sort of find the latest and greatest and how people are doing things, uh, but based on not just conjecture, but on science, if we can. You know, what, what is really tried and true, what, what do we know and what don't we know? We try to be very clear on that. And you can find that podcast really anywhere you can find podcasts, you know, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, it's out there. Uh, we've had a great response. Like I said, we're getting you know, good guests on, um, you know, we'll continue to try to get excellent guests on. I'll just really encourage everybody 
to uh, listen to that podcast as well as this one. So appreciate that for sure. And yeah, I also likewise encourage you all to check out the Compete Like a Champion podcast. So, uh, Dr. Lauer, where can we learn more about what you're doing and, and perhaps follow you and also USTAPD? Well, certainly you can check us out on our website, uh, Player Development. Um, that's a good place to find the, the newest stuff that we're putting out, on, certainly on social media as well. Um, you can check us out, you know, USTA under Player Development. Uh, so I think those are places where new things are coming out or different things that we're doing. Uh, for for youth, uh, our net generation, USDA's net generation movement is a great place. They're putting out a lot of great resources and they're putting out things you can do at home to continue to play tennis or play games that keep you engaged and have fun. So uh, lots of opportunities there for people. I know it's tough, you know, being inside, being sheltered, uh, but when you're creative and you have patience, you actually can can learn a lot from this time period. Yeah, for sure. And a uh, big shout out to USTA over there in Orlando. I've, I've had David Ramos, Satoshi Ochi, and Martin Blackman on my podcast and summits before and all uh, great people over there. Uh, one last question for you before we go is what is one key tip that you can give our audience to help us improve our tennis games? Well, now you put me on the spot. Okay. One key tip. I would say, man, just stay present. You know, when you're out there and you're doubting yourself. When you start to feel anxious, you feel tight. Go back, take a couple deep breaths behind the baseline and just encourage yourself. I talk about breathe and believe, but just remind yourself of something that you can do, that you practice, something that you know you can create, whether it's hitting a certain serve or you know, getting the return back with depth. And just that understanding that all these things that you feel are normal in tennis. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get angry. You're going to get anxious. You're going to get tight. Every player experiences them. Does Roger somehow experience them different than we do? Probably. But he still feels them. He talks about it. So know that these things are normal. Accept them and really start to breathe through your experiences, slowing your breath down, taking big diaphragmatic breaths, and then encourage yourself, focus on one simple thing that you know you can do and then just come with energy. And I think if you if you do that, I think that will improve your tennis. Awesome. Well, Dr. Larry Lauer, uh, I really appreciate you coming on to the podcast. And I know we're cutting it close with your next appointment. So I really appreciate your time and all the best to you and the staff. And uh, stay safe out there. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I enjoyed it and uh, appreciate the great questions and the discussion. Thanks a lot. All right, I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Lauer. And if you need to find any links, they'll be on the show notes page. And you can also go to tennisfiles.com slash podcasts to check out the links. Um, I also would like to request for you to leave a review for the show. If you haven't already yet, it would be really helpful to give the show more visibility to uh, other tennis players who can benefit from it. And you can do so by going to tennisfiles.com slash Apple Podcasts or to leave a review on your favorite podcast app. It would be much appreciated. And I also want to leave you with a quote as I do at the end of every show. And this one is by Steve Jobs. And Mr. Jobs said, if you're working on something that you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. Um, and that is very true. Um, even with tennis, it makes it a lot easier when you have a vision for what you want to achieve in the game and that vision will pull you toward it and it'll really help you work hard. It kind of makes me think about like when I have a big tournament or some sort of playoffs, uh, coming down and I think about how I want to do well in it, then it just makes practice and training uh, much easier to do. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. I really appreciate you supporting the show and listening as always. And I'll see you on the next episode of the Tennis Files podcast. This is your host, Mirabon Aranshad, signing out. Mm-hmm.